important, important players for a, particular, for a particular query or important places, and you can put it on the map. And you can also see how a query is important over time. So you can have this kind of a nice um, time dimension exploration or browsing uh, uh, kind of thing. Again, there's nothing that precludes you from building this thing with open source stuff and some basic knowledge of information retrieval. You just need to have the idea and the energy. You just need to you know, study this thing for a while. And the tools are there. That's the great part. I mean, they weren't there when I started, but now there's a huge open source community around this. Uh, so you know, wanting, wanting is, is power. I mean, you just need to, to have the desire to, to do something cooler than this, hopefully. All right, so why is this hard? Well, I mean, the problem is super easy to understand, right? So you really need to just find out what a user needs, and you need to do it quickly, right? We said no three hours waiting. But there's a lot of challenges here. So for instance, user intention. So how do you determine what is on the user's brain by two keywords, or one keyword, or three keywords? So it's very tough. Think about how you use a search engine, right? You say, food Bangalore, or you know, pizza restaurant. But when you ask a friend, you, do you know if there's any nice Italian restaurant uh, around here that could serve pizza and is reasonably priced? You don't go and say, pizza restaurant. But we say that to the search engines, right? <laughs> don't we? Um, I have an explanation for that, and it's because we're taught to do that, because long queries, they, they tend to underperform. Um, but it's suboptimal. It's not the way we communicate. So why is the way we tell the machine? Why has the machine has to be smarter than, than, than a human? You know, accessibility, uh, volatility, redundancy. So you know, in the web, the web is a mess, and we'll see that later. But there's a lot of duplicates here and there. Uh, there's a lot of low-quality documents. There's a lot of opinions. There's a lot of bias. There's, uh, different kinds of formats. Right? There's things that come and go. There's web pages that they just create and they disappear. Links uh, appear and disappear. How do you deal with all that? And then on top of that, there's a lot of these resources and they're growing. So your algorithms need to keep up with that. So that's one of the biggest scales. So all this is very difficult. Now you put the volume dimension there and it's very tough. And scale, so what you mean by scale is that you want an algorithm that, I mean, saying it plainly, if you put more machines, then you can handle more resources, right? This is what scale is. And still, you know, what I said, you know, this scale, whatever, uh, this is from Prabhakar Raghavan. He used to say that the main bottleneck is still human cognition. It's not computational. It's understanding how we think. This is why semantic search might be interesting because it might bring us one little step closer to being able to figure out why, uh, what, what we're thinking, right? or looking for something. <clears throat> anyway, so information retrieval is mostly about relevance. So you know, we saw the definition and you all understood what it was relevant in that context, but I I'm telling you, trying to put an equation into what relevance is is not very easy. So relevance is, is the core concept in IR. Right? But I don't think anybody has come with a good definition for that. So it can be something that is useful. It can be something that is topically coherent with what, we wanna, what you're looking for. Something that is new. Some you know, new search, for instance. It has to be new. If it is topically coherent, but it's something that happened 20 years ago, then it's not relevant. Maybe it has to be interesting. Or maybe not. Maybe it, can, maybe it has to be boring. But still, you know, we really want relevant information. So this is one of the biggest discussions in IR. Really, what is relevant? What are all these dimensions of relevance? And how do, do we put a number in these dimensions? Um, and this it has a lot to do with uh, the way we use the search engines. It also has a lot to do with evaluation, right? Because relevance is the way we say, this search engine is better than this one, or this technique is better than this one. Uh, and you'll have three hours in that, so I can happily skip that. And then, you know, information is maybe expressed as a query, but users, I say, don't often know what they want. I say, most of the time, you don't know what you want. Uh, and this comes from somebody who has looked at the, um, 
at this problem for a while. So there are a lot of problems. We'll see examples of this. So one is that you have to verbalize your information. Right? You need to come up with a mental representation of what you want, and that's not easy. Also, you need to understand the syntax. You know, what are the parameters, the operators that the search engine accepts? And you need to understand the search engine. You need to understand what is failing, and you know, should you add more keywords, take out some keywords, what have you got to do to, to make it work better? So this is a very far-fetched example. Okay? But it kind of illustrates uh, three, three of the problems, three of the issues that you know, we face as users. So imagine you are hungry, and you're a tourist, and you're in Barcelona, and you want to find a place to eat, but you don't want to spend a lot of money. So this is what you want, right? But then when you think about what you really want in your, in your brain, you, you say, I want information of places with cheap food in Barcelona. So now cheap food is not the same as I don't want to spend a lot of money, right? You, you can have proper food <laughs> that doesn't make you spend a lot of money, right? So this is a misconception, something that you think is in a particular way, but it's not. Then there's a mistranslation, so it's, it's how you actually verbalize this, right? So it's information about bars in Barcelona. So a bar is not the right place to go for food in Barcelona. But well, maybe you're a tourist tourist. But anyway, <laughs> it's not where you want to go. And then you have to enter a query after your, your verbalization. And maybe you enter bar, Barcelona. And that's completely wrong, right? So think about it. So the search engine just looks at this, <laughs> where you want this thing here. So you need to go through all this process and figure out what she wants. Anyway, so it's hard because we need representation. We need to put all these documents, all these pieces of information in a machine-readable uh, format. So, you know, semantics, what do words mean? Right? This semantic search tries to add one layer of knowledge on, on top of just plain strings, plain keywords. Natural language, so how do we say things? What is the structure of the grammar that we use? And of course, this changes from language to language, so it adds more complications to, to the problem. And this is not easy for computers, right? I've been talking about this a lot, and, uh, and possibly you'll hear tomorrow more about this. Okay, other problems. Context, right? Somebody issues the query sponge, what do you want? No. This or SpongeBob? So maybe a kid wants SpongeBob. So you need to know where the user comes from, which you don't know most of the times. Then opinion, right? So people issue these queries all the time, right? So funny. So for instance, the Jackass TV show, right? These guys uh, kick each other's ass in the show badly every, every program, right? They, they do really nasty things to each other. And some people happen to find it really funny. But, I, <laughs> but not my dad, right? Um, talented. So this is the Baywatch. So some people will say these three girls are very talented. No, really, depends, depends on the angle you look at it. They might be talented, but you know, maybe for a general audience, they're not talented. Also, honest. <laughs> I'm being recorded. I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I work for an American company. Um, <laughs> but you see where I'm going, right? Uh, and this is the typical example. No, those were sort of here, but it's the typical example you get when somebody tries to explain to you why searching for information is very hard, and it's you know the semantics. So bank, so somebody enters the query bank, what do you want? Bank note, a river bank, a actual financial financial institution, or a blood bank. Right. So it can mean many many things. So ambiguity is a big issue, uh, and this is what semantics bring into the picture. They try to chop chop down the fat into ambiguity and, and try to extract the right amount of, of, of semantics in the right amount of knowledge. So quickly, what, what, is about, what is it like to be a search engine? These are real, real queries that, that we get. So you know, queries can be ambiguous, like Jaguar. So which Jaguar are you looking for? Are real queries. Or they can be under-specified. So Iraq. So somebody inputs this query. This is not ambiguous. You know what Iraq uh, she's trying to find. But what do you want to do with that? Do you want news about Iraq? You're looking for a visa to get in Iraq? What do you want to do? Uh, latest release, ThinkPad drivers, touchpad. So here, the difficult part is latest release. Uh, what is the last one? Right? How do you identify that some item is newer than other item? Uh, eBay, I guess. You, know, you want to go to this site. So 
Is that just you want to get there, or you want information about it, or, or, or what do you want? First, this is an actual query. So, you know, can you imagine being the search engine? So, what, what you do, do you reply to this? So your best friend comes next to you and says, first. First, what? <laughs> uh, Google or, you know, typos like Britney Spears. Again, real queries. So you have to, to deal with all this, right? So it's a big engineering challenge as well, just to cope with all these kind of errors. So search is a multi-step process. You know, from a cognitive perspective, what you do is you verbalize your query, you look for a document, you try to find your information in the document, and if you're not happy, you go back, you refine, you add queries, uh, keywords, remove keywords, uh, click somewhere else. And you do that until you find what you're looking for, you get bored and move on to some other search engine or, or to do something else. Now, you might also go to a particular site. You know, we've seen a lot of examples of that. That's, I guess, called teleporting. So but this needs some you know, kind of advanced uh, knowledge of what's going on. So you need to know what sites are available, what are the data that these sites have, um, how it's represented, and for what queries these sites are better than general web search. And that might be because you know, just coming up with a query might be very, very hard, or because you trust more the final site than, than, than the actual uh, search engine. All right, so I have a few examples. I'm going to be late, but it doesn't really matter. A anyway, so Dan Russell was um, like a search experience uh, uh, vice president of Google or something like that. He has some amazing slides online. Like completely different from anything you would expect from an information retrieval presentation. So it's like trying to make you think about the process itself. Um, so this is one of the examples he has. You know, so, so somebody told me that in the mid-800s, uh, people usually will carry around a special kind of notebook. They will use the notebook to write down quotations that he heard or copy passages from books. That the notebook was an important part of their education and has a particular name. So what was the name of the notebook? So this is interesting because you are entering into somebody else's information need space. So you're trying to get into somebody else's brain and trying to understand what this person was looking for and how would you formulate this query. So I won't tell you the answer unless I click on next, it shows up there, here. But, but you should think about this offline, right? You could just figure out how, how would you look for this particular item and, and what happens. Another good one. Right? This little indentation here, what's the name of that? It has a name. It has a Wikipedia page. Right. So how do you look for that? I mean, think about what would be the query that you input into the search engine to find that. So I think something like upper indentation lib uh, works. Right? But, but you get you get the idea, right? You have this, you, know, you completely understand what you're looking for, but how do you verbalize it? Right? It's called pilfering or something like that. Anyway, there are more tasks right, out there. So some, some of your user needs might be better served with an image or with a video uh, or with a map. I mean, you, go, you wanna go from here to here, you really want a map. You don't want a, a web document or other resources. Uh, something that helps when you're trying to find out something that you cannot find uh, and you cannot find it, it's to think of synonyms. So for instance, this query was around, it was, uh, a friend told me that there is an abandoned city in the waters of San Francisco Bay. Is that true? And if it is true, what was the name of the supposed city? So it's true. And if you look for abandoned city, San Francisco, there's a lot of, or there used to be a lot of junk, right? Maybe a lot of people trying to figure this out now, uh, use the search engine and, and now, you know, the good result went higher. But what you need to look is for ghost, ghost town, San Francisco, and that's gonna work. So you know, think of alternate formulations for what you're trying to look for. Uh, some other user needs require explore a topic in depth. You're doing some research on something, you wanna know about this particular event, this, this you, know, you know, about the history of India. Right? So I was reading the Wikipedia page, you wanna explore that in depth, and you wanna know who were the important people, where were the important events, and you want to spend time on that. You want to use a search engine and assist, uh, the search engine to assist you uh, into, into finishing that task. Um, so that's completely different than typing Google in Google. Right? Um, there's also something useful is to refine your question. So imagine that you want to buy a unicycle uh, for your mom or dad. How will you find it? So you start with very general words and you start 
narrowing down your search, adding more keywords there that will actually lead you to a proper unicycle for, for your parents. I don't know who won that for their parents, but anyway. Uh, and also this, and I think you'll hear about this later on as well, you might be looking for lists of information. You might be looking for a list of all the groups that inhabited California at the time of the mission. So how smart will a search engine be if it can just display the list of groups right away out of this question? I mean, parsing the question is sort of hard. For a human, but, um. <clears throat> so this is what it's all about. So refining, uh, exhaustive search, exploratory seeking, no night and finding. So th these are all different IR tasks, different kind of things that you want to do with, a, with an IR system. So no night and finding means you want to retrieve some data you know it's six. For instance, what, what, what was the year in uh, which Peter Mika was born. Uh, you know, that exists, you want to find it. Exploratory, so you want to find some information through an iterative process, like the unicycle thing. Uh, and there's no single, single answer for your query. There might be many, many different answers for what you're trying to do. Uh, exhaustive search, you want to find all the information possible about a particular issue. And this is very valuable for some companies. That is using, like, think of market analysis, right, or social media analysis. You want to find everything that people are talking about a particular issue in the world. Um, and you need a lot of queries to cover that information. And maybe you cannot cover, depending on what is the issue. And refining. I mean, you've been into this site before, and you want to find it again. And that happens more often than, than what you would think. Anyway, so scale. So there's a lot of information. It's, 300 terabytes of print data produced per year. So if you have videos, images, and digital information, that is 600 petabytes per, day, per, per year. Uh, you have to be fast, you have to be scalable. Information is dynamic, and you have to cope with data. And the user changing in her mind, which happens a lot. It's looking for something, and it just wants moves on to something else, and, and one then comes back. So. These things introduce, as I say, tensions in every step, in every box of the search engine uh, uh, design. Last, well, I'm taking so long. Anyway, if you want to publish anything in information retrieval conferences, not sure if you want, not sure you, you should. Um, so it's, a, it's, you know, the methodology there is, is very strong. So you want to get a paper in, you know, methodology plays a crucial role. You won't get a paper without experimentation done in the proper way. Uh, there are essentially three types of IR papers uh, or IR research. So one is systems, so it's trying to make things faster, trying to make things more scalable. And that one is on methods, so effect effectiveness, right? So how do we uh, retrieve information in a, in, uh, in, a, in a better way? Another one is applications. So it's how do we make a user's life easier when they're using our particular uh, system? And then empirical evaluation plays a critical role across all these lines of research. And you need to be very aware of that. It's a very highly applied scientific discipline. It has to be experimentation. And it's a, you know, experimentation is a critical component of the scientific method itself. So, you, know, you, know, you want to be sure that what you're finding out is for real, then, uh, then, then you need to run experiments and statistical uh, uh, validation. Too. And then Poor experimental methodologies are not scientifically sound. They should be avoided. Right. So don't get it. All right. So I think we're going to have a, a quick break now um, for, for this first half, and then we'll go deeper. Have any quick questions? I've, I've taken a lot of time. Is anybody awake? I can't see you. Is anybody here? No? All right. So break. So, okay. So uh, we have this particular problem. Oh. I'll turn it off, right? Okay. We have this particular problem. Um, I think I'm a bit late already, so I might rush through some of the slides that I find the least interesting.
especially the ones you can find on textbooks. Um, so I've been hammering your heads for like an hour on what information retrieval is and why it's exciting and, and why is it cool to work on that. What does web search have to do with it? Well, so mostly everything. Uh, but there's some differences. Uh, this is the same more or less big picture that, that I told you before, right? So somebody has a task that she wants to fulfill. And this task is breaking up into one or many information needs, which are then verbalized. So you don't have to say what you're thinking, but in your, in your mind, there's, there's a model of what you want to look for. And that is translated into a query, which uh, unfortunately is a few keywords at the moment. Um, and that and a huge corpus of documents, a collection, is the input for a search engine. The search engine is going to return results for your query, and then you might want to refine the query and go back to the search engine for more results and, and be in this loop forever. Uh, this might sound pretty basic, but this is from a paper from 2001. So it's not super old. Right? You might think that it has 100 years old, but it doesn't. Um, <clears throat> So what are the steps, the, the steps that you, you have to make uh, to get there? Um, the arrows, maybe, I think the arrows follow the flow more than the dependencies, so you don't, don't get fooled by, by that. So everything, again, starts with document collection, which you process, you do a lot of stuff, uh, which, is, which is very uh, engineer intensive and, and very hacky, right? But in the end, you come up with an index, we'll see how this goes and some metadata about your collection, right? So here, in this huge box is a lot of works. It's crawling, text processing, indexing, voodoo, anything. So then out of this, you have a document interpretation. You have a view of your document, you know, how the machine understands what a document is like. Um, and then from the user interface, you, know, the, you interpret. You, you try to guess what the user is looking for. And you kind of make a query interpretation that has to be able, you need to match these two, right? So they have to be comparable. They have to be in the same space or hypothesis space. Uh, and there's some uh, balloon here that does matching and ranking. So matching essentially decides that this document is a good candidate for, for what you're looking for. And ranking says, well, this is one good or two good or three good or 100,000 on this big box, so what you do is you have a crawler, so it's a process that goes out on the web and fetches pages continuously. Um, these pages are these documents here, which go through an, a natural language processing pipeline, which can be uh, you know, more or less uh, involved. Say. Um, to the very basic, you need to be able to chop down these documents into individual pieces that will act as your indexing units. So these are tokens, so think of the words of the document, so how you're going to be able to decide that a query uh, and a document match together, right? So it's with these tokens here, which are fed into the indexer. Um, the indexer is sort of interesting. I'm not going to be talking a lot about index construction or at all. Um, but essentially, like the problem of creating this data structure here um, gave rise to MapReduce. And in turn to Hadoop, and in turn, possibly to all this big data crunching revolution. So, so this is a pretty cool box. So out of this box, you get the index, and then there's a query system that talks to this index and is able to, you know, as I said, uh, match representations of queries and documents together. All right. On an architectural uh, standpoint, You don't have, you do have a lot of machines. I mean, this won't happen on, on a laptop, right? You cannot have all the web stored on, on your MacBook. So essentially how it works is that the user uh, talks to a DNS server, which points you to a broker. So a broker is a big machine that decides uh, where your query is going to be routed to. So how, what is the flow that is going to go? So the broker decides, all right, so this query is going to go to this uh, cluster here, uh, 
which is this funky uh, rack of computers. And clusters, they contain a lot of computers. So essentially, there are two dimensions here, a horizontal and a vertical dimension. So the horizontal dimension is that this cluster and this cluster do not store the same documents or terms. But think of documents by now. So they have uh, disjoint um, uh, sets of information, sets of documents. Now, vertically, you do replication. So this guy and this guy, they contain the same information. So why are, are these two dimensions important? Right? Why would you waste your resources putting these machines doing what other machines are doing? So essentially, horizontal um, gives you high ability, uh, uh, throughput, like high performance. So you're, you, you can go faster if you, uh, if you split the load. Uh, and replication is mostly for um, fault tolerance. Right? If something crashes, then you want to be able to push um, some other machine to do the job for you. In between, uh, you have the cache. Cache is super important for a search engine. I mean, it's bringing you possibly 70, 80% of the performance. So why these things are fast is because of the cache. So the cache essentially stores um, the pre-computer results for queries. So people ask for the same query multiple times. And some queries are very popular. So you don't have to go here every single time to decide which documents you want, because you have it on the cache. Uh, and that's mostly it. And this is a very <laughs> uh, crude sort of uh, picture, but it is what it is. Now, of course, the, the, the web. Right? So everything is linked on the web. So pages link to other pages. So you have a web graph, right? So the nodes are the pages, are, and the links are the edges. And you can walk through the graph. So you can discover new pages by following these links, which is what a crawler does. Right? So in order to uh, see all the web, in order for your search engine to be able to uh, index all the web, you follow these links. Now, this graph is useful for another set of things. So one is that you can rank documents using the graph. So it's like the uh, essence of page rank. So if some guy is very highly linked, and the pages that link to this guy are, are very high quality, then this guy must be very good. Right? So the graph is also bringing you information about what is good and what is bad on the web. It can be also used for detecting spam. Right? There's some particular link structures that you can find on this graph. You can mine these link structures and use them for spam classification, deciding if a page is malicious or not. And this is, you know, possibly, arguably, is one of the main differences between traditional IR and web search, that you have this graph. <clears throat> so, anyone knows what this is? We can't see. Are you all sleepy already? I think one of my, my objectives is to make half of you uh, awaken by the end of the talk without the techno music. Anyway, so this is the web. As discovered by uh, Andre Brother and colleagues, a very old uh, snapshot of the web, that only contain links to the central core, but there's no links back. Right? So you cannot go from here to here. So essentially, these are like new pages. Right? You create your new site, and you link to Google, and you're going to be here in this scene. Uh, Set. And then out is the opposite. So these guys here link to the pages in out, but they don't link to anywhere. So essentially, these are pages that only have intra host links. Right? Very selfish pages and never link anywhere else. And this, these tendrils uh, are things that link to something that is not in the central core. And there's some pages that kind of mm -hmm. bypass the central core, which are called tubes. And there's also some disconnected components. There's 17 million pages. Uh, and then, so what, when I was um, just reading this, this figure, I, I thought, well, they're going to ask me one question about this. Right? So how do you discover these guys? If they're never linked or nobody links to them. How do you get there? So I think the answer is that this was done on the Alta Vista crawl, back when Andre was still in Alta Vista. And people could enter their own sites 
into the, into the search engine. Say, oh, yeah, my site is this one, please scroll. Right? But nobody was linking to them, and they weren't linking to anybody. Um, and there were a lot of those. Or maybe there were pages that were abandoned, uh, and the links were removed, and they were still there. And you know about them because you have them on a previous, previous call list. So it looks a bit like a, like a monster, right? The, the picture, but uh, it's actually a snapshot of the web. And uh, this was very surprising when it came out. I mean, people were making all kind of crazy hypotheses about the, how the graph of the web would look like. And uh, this was very surprising for, for a lot of people. Another surprising fact that also Andre came up with is that search queries are actually very short, right? Two or three keywords, so it's like 2.5 in average. Depends on, on the country. Um, because before that, before the 2000, and again, information retrieval has a long history, people thought that queries were really large and you have these huge descriptions of information needs. Uh, and this is what people were researching with at the time, which is, has nothing to do from a technical standpoint with short queries. All right, so web search. You know, the, the basic search technology is the same as the basic IR how you represent things, how you index things, how you rank stuff. Uh, but then the scale changes the game completely. And you have to start making a lot of architectural decisions, how, uh, how you engineer your different components in order to be able to cope up with all that stuff. Again, you cannot wait for three hours for, for an answer. Then the link structure, you know, I've said enough about this. But you can acquire data, you can rank using the, the link structure. Uh, and also something that is pretty cool is the, whoa, I'm talking to the microphone, uh, to extend the document representation. So essentially in the anchor text, you can add words. You're linking to this page, but you, you put a sentence or, or, or words or whatever while you're linking to this page. And essentially in the representation of the page you're pointing at, you can add these words. And this is very valuable because maybe you didn't think that these words would represent your page. You will never get a match from a query if it wasn't from this anchor text. Right? So this is a, a very important component uh, to increase retrieval in